to, to talk to Morning. Angie, uh, General Manager for Microsoft Ireland. Uh, just thank you very much uh, for joining thank us. You. So, the Great topic, to see everybody this morning in person. Indeed, indeed. It's wonderful to see uh, such a, a, a large room of diverse faces in terms of, of uh, every cohort, I think, is, is here, which is fantastic to see. But we're here this morning to talk about a new concept called digital perseverance, which, which is uh, intriguing, to, to say the least. But uh, just before we get into that, um, we, we've just heard an important update from, uh, from Mark there in the Central Bank of Ireland. So what's your initial reaction? To uh, obviously, I've just heard it live, like everybody else. I think a few, few comments. I spend a lot of time with business leaders, and I would say, um, you know, what I'm hearing is quite obviously similar to what Mark has gone through. You know, inflationary pressures, um, skills shortage, the war, supply chain issues, you know, cyber security threats. So there is a lot of pressures affecting all, it, it, like large industry, small industry. So I think, you know, would really um, empathize with organizations that are going through that. That's a, what we have to live with at the moment. I think the second on the labor side, so fantastic to hear that we have more women entering the workplace. So I think that's important. It's a passion of mine for years, but also for Microsoft. I think the flip side for, you know, a, um, an extremely low unemployment rate is the skills shortage. Yeah. I think, you know, there isn't probably a business leader here in the room that isn't concerned about um, skills and particularly digital skills. Actually, an interesting stat, by 2030, 90% of all roles will have a digital element to it. So I think upskilling and how we find new workforce is super important. I think the other comment I would make is, you know, some industries are going to weather this through, others won't. Those that are very exposed to let maybe less B2B, more B2C, and particular cohorts of society, I think, you know, what we're going to discuss around perseverance and resilience um, will really will really test it. So that that would be my initial comments. Very good. I think we'll we'll, we'll certainly be digesting it for uh, for some time to come for for its implications, but. Uh, Moving on then to, to our main theme this morning, this idea of digital perseverance. So explain a little bit about how the term came about because it's, it's as a result of a lot of observation but also yeah. research and, and analysis. So I think, so it, you know, digital perseverance, building what I just discussed, which is around the challenges facing any organization like inflation, the list that I, I gave earlier on, I think it's really, really important. There was incredible momentum during COVID organizations achieved incredible things, um, particularly digital innovation, um, ability to go online, automation, things were done in that 24 month period. And uh, like CEOs, business leaders say to me, we just never knew we could do it, Anne. And I think it's really important that we don't lose that momentum. So the, the whole idea on digital perseverance is we need to persevere through this. We need to continue to use technology to enable us to reach our customers in a better way, to provide better customer service, to figure out how we streamline um, supply chain, how do we become more sustainable, and that we really don't lose the momentum that we had. Let me give you an example. I was, I'm from Ennis, so I was in Ennis at the weekend, and I happened to be um, in a boutique and I was chatting to the lady, the owner to say, like, how is business? She was like, I never had an online presence before COVID. I had to rush together to get a website. And I was saying to her, how are things now? And she's like, my footfall is up threefold, right? So people might be spending a little bit less when they're in, but the fact that she has an online presence, she can communicate to a much broader base, either sell online or they're coming into the store, just shows what we've achieved. And therefore, we just have to weather this through. And that's what digital perseverance is. And think about the word, right? We have to, and I think the tech sector, we have a role to play to enable organizations. And it's not just large companies, it's every organization just to persevere through this. So it's, it's, it's like a learned skill in, in dealing with the Absolutely. uncertainty that you, yeah. you get to practice it and become... Well, I think we found muscles, all of us, in all our organizations during COVID that we never knew we did, we had. And therefore, we don't want to go back and say, well, let's go back to, like, the amount of, of leaders that say projects that, you know, had a timeline of three years were done in six months, mm. you know, because we had to work in a different way. We had, you know, we had to do things in a different way. So what, we, what the muscles we learned there and the culture we created there is so important that we continue 
to develop those uh, cultures, muscles, ways of working, whatever it is, as we go through the next wave of challenges we have. Okay, okay. Well, one of the implications for this is the fact that um, in learning to deal with so much change while also implementing so yeah. much change is that leadership uh, is, is, is changing in itself. And uh, we, we, we were just discussing a little bit beforehand mm -hmm. where, where we were talking about the fact that the middle management in particular is getting directives from on high in terms of transformation, but also the, the new um, adaptability yeah. and the new expectations of the workforce. So while business leadership has to change from the top, those middle managers are, are really tasked with a, a heavy burden as well. So tell us a little bit about how business leadership is changing in light of yeah. these kinds of concepts. So we, in Microsoft, um, we do a global survey. We did one six months ago, it's called the Work Trend Index. I encourage you all to, to download it and have a look. But we've just done one, so that goes to 20,000 employees across multiple countries, so really, really extensive. And three insights came out of it, but one I'll pick out basically just to kind of bring to life um, my response to, to your question. And that was a really, like, a, one of the big insights was employees going, can we end the productivity paranoia? And they were the like, same words used by multiple people. So what does that mean? The survey showed that 87% of employees are saying they're more productive. However, 85% of leaders, that includes middle management, were saying their instinct, and that's an interesting word, tells them that their employees are not more productive. Now, actually, the data is showing that globally we're all working 45 minutes more every day because actually we're prepared to give some of our commute time. Mm. And actually, if we average out what we can see across like, um, one of our platform's teams, the, av the aggregated usage shows that meetings are up 158%. So the data shows that, in general, we are more productive. Mm. And I think for leaders, the challenge is, and this is what we spoke uh, before about the visual cue. So what's the visual cue? It means, I saw Anne in the office today, she was in at eight and she left at seven. She's super productive. Well, the visual cue doesn't work in a hybrid world. So we have to use and let technology enable the data. We have to give data to our middle managers and to our leaders so that we actually understand what's going on. I, in Microsoft, we have a particular platform and I get insights every day and weekly. It's incredible. I know how many internal meetings, I know if I have taken a lunch break, if I haven't, have I done one-to-ones, am I more external or internal? And we can aggregate up those insights and then you can make decisions. And actually the um, survey showed that, you know, Prior to COVID, maybe there was paranoia, don't, you know, big brother data, all that kind of stuff. Employees want you to have the data now, mm. and they want right decisions and appropriate decisions for them to come out of the data. So we really have to empower leaders. The second thing that came from the research was around being super clear on goals and priorities. So not just being, you know, busyness. It was like, can you be really clear about what my goals and priorities are, and can we discuss them regularly so that I'm progressing and that they're relevant? So I think the role of the manager and the leader to be really, really clear with their teams and their employees about what their goals and priorities are. And then the last part was the continuous feedback loop. Mm. So spending much more time on one-to-ones, shorter one-to-ones, much more regular, how are we getting on? So I think there, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting discussion, but I think we have to enable leaders and managers with the right digital tools, the right tech, and the skills. It does seem that it's, it's a strange dichotomy that when so much of transformation is entirely data driven, yeah. that, uh, as you said, that, that instinct metric is so strong that when these people are used to relying on data for fundamental changes, yeah. that when it comes to people, there might be some hesitancy or, or perhaps a lack of data in, in some organizations. Yeah, I think, look, it's, it's the next evolution of, of hybrid working. So I think we were all you know, remote, then we went through the phase, of, and actually in the previous survey, really what employees were saying is, can you get data? Can you give, can you get data, look at the data and drive change on the back of the data, right? Then we've moved on now, which is what are you using with the data and can you be really clear about my objectives, as I've just said. Um, but I think we need to equip our managers. Like they're so important. It doesn't matter whether you're a business with three people and you're the leader, like you're the manager of those, uh, of that team. We have to equip them now for hybrid working. 
And there are certain skills that we need to learn. It's how do you use the data? How do you interpret it? Then how do you bring a human element to it? How do you be an authentic leader, which goes, look, I can see from the data you're working long hours or whatever the case may be, and actually sit down and but make it data-based and then bring the human element. And that's, we just got to invest the time to kind of coach that layer within our organization. Um, and if we don't, I think that divide right between the employee and the leaders, I'm productive, no, I don't think you are. Mm. I think think instinct, those words need to be replaced with, well, factually. Mm. And that's, well, the next, that's the next journey I think we're all on. And, and, and indeed it brings us nicely into the fact that we, we have all observed and seen reported the fact that attitudes are changing as a result of what people have experienced in, in recent mm -hmm. times. Expectations are different, but also maybe tolerance levels are, are different, and people are tending to dictate perhaps a bit more how they want to work. So tell us a little bit more ab about those kinds of changing attitudes, because again, you've got a lot of research, you've got a lot of data gathered because of the tools and platforms that you have. So what, what have you seen, I suppose, what have you been intrigued by and, yeah. and what are the implications you're taking from it? I think maybe just to go back to the research, so the, three thing, the three primary things that came out of the research was one, in the productivity paranoia, we've discussed that. The second was, I come into the office for communication and connection, not organisation leads. Interesting, come mm. back to that in a second. And the third was around, we all need to re-recruit our employees which is quite a statement. So if I go back to the second one around employees are saying they want to come in for community and connection. That means people want to come into the office to build bonds, to uh, form teams, to reconnect with the purpose of their organization. So what's the purpose of my company? What are we doing, right? That's super, super important to employees. If there's clear goals and priorities, then the organization leads will take care of themselves. So employees don't want to come into the office just because they have to hear about the goals. They want to come in to form that connection and that community. So that's super, super important. Um, and I think also that gives an energy and a fresh energy when employees come in. I think the re, uh, on the re-recruit um, employees, that's, I think that's that was really, interesting. really interesting. Because you've kind of two cohorts. You have the cohorts that joined during COVID that really you know, don't necessarily have a full connection with the organization. And that's where purpose is super important, mm. right? Because people would have made a move and joined the organization because of the culture, the values, the purpose. So making sure that they're getting that connection when they come in or when you know, you're in, in a hybrid world is, is really important. The second are employees that have probably been five years or more with an organization. They, that reconnecting with them, the energy levels, super important. But the biggest thing that came out of the survey was that cohort really wanting learning and development, right? So there was some interesting words that came out of the survey, which was employees know their worth now. So we all know our worth, right? And that's fine, that's a good thing. But actually, this, you can longer say, I'm in a role, and that role is going to be the same in three years' time. I can say from a Microsoft perspective, things are changing so fast in the world that roles, you know, are like six, seven months, they evolve. And therefore employees are like, I want to invest in my learning and my skills. And we had a good discussion before, and that doesn't need to be, everybody's got to do an MBA. It could be what you're passionate about. If you're passionate about sustainability, if you're passionate about DNI, whatever the passion is, to allow time for learning and development. And it, you don't need big budgets, right? There's lots of government programs there. You could go onto Microsoft and get accreditations you know, other tech companies. So it's about getting an individual plan. That's super important. Because actually the, the data is saying when an employee leaves, often employers think it's because it's more money. Sometimes, yeah, you might get some money for a bonds. More, it's like, well, I wasn't learning. I couldn't see my path. My skills weren't developing. And back to the earlier point about by 2030, 90% of all roles will have a digital element. Well, everybody wants to set themselves up for the future. So that learning and development, and, and again, that's, I don't want you to think just I'm not a large organization and only large organizations do it. It doesn't matter if you have two, three people on your team, they may be interested in something. We do in Microsoft, we do flexible Fridays, Friday afternoon. So obviously if you need to be with a customer or there's something, you prioritize that. But we do try and not have internal meetings so people can focus on their learning and their development. Now, how do we know we're doing that? You know, the concept of employee experience platforms now where employees do, you know, do everything on the platform. So therefore, that's how you get the data. You know, you know, are they taking a lunch break? Are they not? Um, 
you know, are they working beyond five o'clock or are they not? So that's how you, know, you can gather the data. Um, but also you can build in learning programs into that. So really, really, I thought it was quite incredible, actually, from the survey done six months ago to the survey now, just mm. how you know, really clear, consistent messages. And this was done across 11 countries. So lots of learning for us to, I think, unpack and, and, and think about. Great, okay. Well, the, one, one of the themes that underpins all of this, and, and, and you touched on it already, is sustainability. And I, I, I think one of the things that comes out from it is the fact that people at every level want to know what their organization is doing and what they can do to, to help that. So talk to us a little bit about sustainability in terms of that sort of thread that, that yeah. uh, I suppose underpins all of those collective efforts. Uh, I mean, any business leader I speak to now, when you talk about their top three uh, challenges and what they're focused on, you know, sustainability is, is right up there. I think, first of all, from a Microsoft perspective, we've made some big, big, um, big commitments. Um, the first is to be, you know, carbon negative by 2030. And then we've gone further to say that we will eliminate all the carbon that we've emitted since we founded in 1975 by 2050. So that's their big goals. And we're really sincere um, in really going after these goals and really committed. Um, and that's important to every single Microsoft person globally. I think, and the work that we're doing with our customers and, and um, organizations across Ireland, every customer is talking to us about it. And actually, only recently, any of you um, go onto my LinkedIn, you'll see it. We published um, work that we've done with Ulster University, who simply decided we want to be paperless, which is kind of a big thing if you're in a university. I know a lot of mm. people have, have technology now, but there's still a lot of paper that, that works around. And we've worked really, really hard during COVID. Um, to you know, ensure that they have the technology now to be a paperless university. So there's loads of examples. And, and I think every organization is kind of looking at the various parts of its HR, finance, supply chain, um, looking at the suppliers. For any of you that are, you know, um, are supplying into organizations now, there's a lot of pressure on to say, are you sustainable? So I think it affects everybody. It affects everybody's supply chain. And we have to continue, and I think you know, Mark referred to it earlier on, we have to continue to work really, really hard in this. There, you know, the technology is there, it's continuously evolving, um, and it's, it's a top priority. And I, again, I think that inclusivity is, is important because communicating internally what you were doing invests people as well so that they sure. can see what their individual roles is contributing and, and uh, they, they can feel part of it. Yeah, I mean, it's back to the purpose and, and talking about community and, and connection. I think when people make a move to change organizations, industry, whatever they do, or they decide I'm going to stay with my organization, you know, everybody looks at the purpose, the mission, the values of an organization, the culture first, right? So mm. I think, you know, how sustainable you are, are you living up to your commitments? Not everybody, you know, we're all not going to get it perfect every time, but it's about being committed, it's about working hard, it's about being super clear with, with your teams, you know, the part that they play, and then measuring it. A lot of the work that we're doing with organizations is trying to gather the data even to start to measure, because if you can measure it, you can figure out where your challenges are, and then you can put plans in to fix it. Very good. Well, I think we, we do have time for uh, a question or two, so uh, if, if, if you would like to. Um, well, uh, first question here is, is around skills. So with the rate of jobs becoming automated, what advice would you give to both graduates and employees in relation to upskilling? So again, exactly what you were talking about in terms of a pathway for yeah. development. I think, look, I think back to the point around digital skills, I think in order for Ireland to continue to be as you know, competitive as we are, we need to keep working on this. Um, let me give maybe some examples from, from Microsoft. Um, we have a program that's called Dream Space. If any of you have kids that follow RT Junior, you'll see that uh, during COVID, um, they were live from, from Microsoft or Dream Space. But the idea of Dream Space is to immerse kids primary and secondary school and expose them to, to STEM, right? Because sometimes some schools don't have that opportunity. Over the last three years, we've put nearly 100,000 children through this program. And our aim over the next three years is to put a million kids north and south. So we'll open dream space in Northern Ireland. Super important. We have incredible um, examples of kids, particularly females, 
that maybe wouldn't have been exposed have gone on to do computer science and, and various different things. So I think the skilling agenda is so important and every single one of us play a role. You don't have to be the size of Microsoft. You know, you can be a very small organization, but give people the opportunity to come in, understand um, and to learn. We also did step into tech. So during COVID, we took 6,000 um, individuals from maybe more the traditional industries that wanted to reskill. Um, and gave them cloud accreditations. And we had, again, some incredible stories, some amazing females that have been out of the workforce for eight years. They got cloud accreditations. Another gentleman uh, that had come from Nigeria was a bus driver in Sligo, got his cloud acc accreditations. And for us to address, back to Mark's earlier point, the labor shortage and the, and the shortages of digital skills, we have to bring new people into the, the digital labor workforce. So that upskilling is super important. I think just to kind of maybe, maybe I haven't answered the question, I don't know, but I think I, I use the word with my team about being curious, right? So it's about being curious and looking at what we think the skills of the future are, and then, you know, finding a course um, that you think would prepare you for that. There are so many different courses out there. So it doesn't always have to be attached to your day job, right? It really doesn't. But it is about being curious, something you're passionate about, and do a course. As I said, it doesn't have to be an MBA. There's, there's lots out that the people can do. So I think that curiosity is the answer and allow, freeing up some time. We're all immensely busy, but you can free up an hour or two a week to go. I'm going to go after, skill myself on something that I'm passionate about. And that's where whoever asked that question, I would focus on. I, I, I think that's absolutely the answer in, in, in terms of those incremental things micro-credentials, everything, Absolutely. just whatever is your passion, just feed it in, yeah. in, in what's available. Um, we, we, we've got another good question here, um, and again, kind of referencing the, the global reach of, of the research, as, yeah. as well as your individual position and, and uh, the, the other country managers you, you would deal with. So how would you say Irish companies compare to UK and European peers in terms of digitizing their business operations? Um, would you say that we're behind the curve or, or somewhere level? I think it's a, it's a hard one to answer because often it's very industry specific, right? Mm. So I would say, you know, generally we had probably not, or we'd be, we're probably middle of the road, I would say, right? But some industries ahead of others. I think COVID, um, in a way, from a technology innovation burst, probably propelled some companies so far forward that they never realized they could do. And I think that goes back to my original point about the perseverance. So all of us achieved things with our businesses during COVID and new avenues, new ways to go to market, new ways to connect with our customers that probably before was on the to-do list and we didn't get to. So we have to persevere with that. We have to somehow figure out the challenges that are facing us, war, inflation, labor shortages, and we have to figure out together ways through that. And I think that comes back to the, di to the digital perseverance. And technology is an enabler. We shouldn't be afraid of it. We should embrace it. Just one final question then, just in terms of the survey that, that, that you referenced, the workforce survey, yeah. how do people go about uh, finding those publications? You're going to research? ask me that now, and I don't know. I presume go on to, we'll publish it afterwards, <laughs> actually. We'll go on to Microsoft. I'm sure there's a link someplace. Well, uh, absolutely. Um, it's if, it's if, Work Trend Index. Zoom at Microsoft. In, in, indeed, if, if you just Google it, you will find it. And in fairness, um, Microsoft has made uh, a lot of research available around those. Yeah. So there's a, a selection. If, if you just Google digital perseverance, there's an excellent blog that has a number of references Justin's there. Justin's blog, yeah, that, absolutely. That jump out into, sure into some can, of the other uh, We can get it to everybody well. afterwards, yeah. Indeed, indeed. Okay, that's that's just about time, and that's all the questions we have time for. So, and thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best, and I hope you all have a great and um, a prosperous year for sure. Indeed, thank you very much.